You know what I want to do, because this is the first talk, and because I, I think it's just really important to get a sense of what sacraments are all about in a general way, I think it's just really very important. I don't think that uh, while it's, sacraments are at the heart of Catholic faith, and uh, in fact the um, Second Vatican Council, the dogmatic mm -hmm. constitution on the, on the church says at the very beginning, the church itself is in the manner of a sacrament, an effective sign of the unity of all humanity and God. And, and the sacramental life of the church is really at the heart of, of our life together. And yet, and yet I don't think uh, that the sacraments are, are well understood. Um, and certainly if you take a look at even uh, practice, it, it, it seems to be on a decline. Uh, for example, in the Archdiocese of Chicago, participation in the Eucharist on a regular basis on Sundays is about 23%. That's pretty low, you know. If the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life, as uh, the, the, the Council said, then there, there's an issue and a problem. And I don't think it is because of bad will. I, I think there are lots of reasons, and I'm not going to get into that now, but I think there are lots of reasons. But I think a fundamental one is that there really isn't a full understanding, a deep understanding of the realities of our sac of a sacramental life. So that's why I think it would be helpful uh, to, to talk a little bit about this. Even those of us, the few of you, the handful, who were schooled in the Baltimore Catechism, a few of you maybe, okay? You remember the definition of a sacrament, a uh, outward sign, Instituted by Christ to give grace. Wow, this is a sharp group. Okay, so uh, that 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 there's truth in that, but I'm thinking back. I was eight years old, I think, when I first memorized that, and we we were able to give it back, you know, recite it and so forth. We didn't understand it, and I don't I don't know if people as they get older really grasp the meaning uh, that is there. So I do want to talk about sacraments. Um, the sacraments in general. And I want to start in a, in a particular place which might surprise you. I'd like to start out with Pope Francis. Everybody loves him, right? You love him? Yeah. yeah. He's just a, a wonderful, wonderful gift that God has given us in the church. What is the first thing that strikes people about Pope Francis? It seems to me it's his humanity. His humanity. Somehow he really is able to engage people. Um, he, uh, he, he came out that, that night on the balcony uh, overlooking St. Peter's Square and he bowed his head and he asked people to pray for him. That's, that's human gesture, you know. And he, he paid his own hotel bill. He's uh, attentive to children and to the disabled. Uh, he really is a very, very human person. Um, but the catch is this, he's not, he's not just everybody's grandfather. I mean, he is that, but he's more than that because clearly, clearly while he's very human, he also stands for God. That's, that's evident. I mean, it's on, his, it's on his lips in what he says and in what he's about. Clearly, he certainly is very human, but also he represents and stands for the presence of God. And it's that conjunction, that conjunction of humanity and divinity that people find very, very attractive, I think. Um, because in this world today, um, it seems like those are incompatible. That, uh, for example, if you really want to be human, and this is a secular agenda in our culture, you can't. You can't include God. You cannot include God. On the other hand, at the other extreme, with re religious fundamentalists, if you uh, are really dedicated to God, humanity doesn't matter. In fact, you can even eliminate people. You can kill in the name of God. So you see the, 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 the poles are there, uh, the incompatibility of humanity and divinity. But for us, for us, and especially in the Catholic faith tradition, they come together they come together in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, who is true God and true man. And we come to understand that God comes to us 
in human and accessible ways. And that's really remarkable, but that's deeply embedded in our Catholic faith, and it's rooted in the Incarnation, Jesus Christ, true God and true man. And in a wider sense, there's a wider sense of this, of sacramentality. We believe the presence of God is mediated in lots of different ways. If you take a look at nature, if you take a look at close, loving human relationships, that God is mediated through all those things. Uh, so uh, there is this whole dimension of mediation, and that's what the sacraments are about. That God comes to us uh, in very accessible ways in sign and symbol. And that's what's uh, behind, uh, behind the sacraments. It's what's behind the church. And, uh, it, and what this means is that we can meet the saving mysteries of Jesus Christ in other words, his death and resurrection in, in sign and symbol, in tangible, accessible ways that are visible, palpable, and, and so forth. So that, in other words, when we celebrate the sacraments, this isn't just a religious ritual. It's not just a sign or a symbol in general. But it really is a living encounter or meeting with Jesus Christ. Now that's, uh, that's very, very significant. And I don't know how many people really understand that or grasp that. But let me, let me continue on to explain this a little bit from a different perspective. If you go through the Gospels and uh, Acts of the Apostles and the writings of the early church, one of the things that you will not find, you will not find any sense of nostalgia for the good old days when Jesus was walking the earth. You will not find that because what those early Christians realized was that Jesus through the word and the sacraments of the church was even closer to people than he had been when he walked this earth. There's a passage in John's Gospel on the night before he dies, as part of his farewell discourse, he says, it is better that I go to the Father, I ascend to the Father, because if I do not ascend to the Father, I cannot send the Holy Spirit to you. But if I ascend to the Father, go to the Father, I will send the Spirit, and that Spirit is sent indeed through the sacraments of the church. And that Spirit becomes interiorized in us. God works in us and in the sacraments through the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so this is just a, a kind of extraordinary, what I call sacramental realism, that when we celebrate the sacraments, we are really having an encounter with the living Christ. And that's pretty extraordinary, isn't it? So it's not a, not a, not a matter of gesture, of uh, exterior ritual. It's not a matter of, of, oh, I have a warm feeling that Jesus is close to me. It's not just a mental thing that, you know, I, I, I have these thoughts, but rather it is a genuine and real encounter with the saving mysteries of Jesus Christ. And how does that happen? It happens through the Holy Spirit, and it happens so that God can share uh, new life with us. So, are we okay so far on that? Because I, I, th I think this is just a tremendously important to have that fundamental understanding of, of sacraments. Now I, I'm going to talk about, uh, first start with uh, baptism. And uh, the, the title of this lecture is Sacraments of Initiation. And I want to clarify something right off the bat, this word initiation, because I think when people hear that, they think, oh, it's kind of like uh, getting into a fraternity or a sorority <laughs> or joining the Alks or the Moose, you know. So that, um, but that is not at all the understanding and the meaning behind the word initiation as it applies to the sacraments. For this initiation really is an entrance, it's an entrance into life in Christ, into a whole new 
way of existing. And uh, that, is the, uh, that is the context. Now, and it starts with uh, the initiation, starts with uh, baptism. And I want to go back to uh, Pope Francis again. One, um, I think it was a Sunday afternoon. No, no, it was a, at a Wednesday audience. Uh, you've perhaps seen these televised, uh, uh, you've seen them on TV, that all of St. Peter's Square is filled up with people who've come to, to see him and, and hear him. And um, his, I think his best remarks are off the cuff. So at one point he put down, he was talking about sacraments, he put down the, uh, the, the prepared text and he looked at the people and he said, do you know, do you know the day you were baptized? And people, when they were panning the crowd, they were a little bit stunned. You know, they didn't, well, maybe, maybe not, more likely not. So he repeated the question, do you know when you were baptized? Well, when you go home, make sure you find out when you were baptized. Why was he so insistent on this? Well, you know, as it unfolded, what, what he was trying to communicate was, this is the gateway. This is the moment when we uh, come into our fundamental identity in Jesus Christ for now and into eternity. Now and into eternity. So the day we were born is certainly a significant day for all of us. But the day we are reborn in Christ in baptism even surpasses that. Um, I, th I think of, for myself, certainly one of the most moving moments of my life was my, my priestly ordination. And it really was a, a wonderful, powerful moment. And I am so grateful to God for the calling and the possibility of, of being a priest. It, it's just, you know, it's been, it's been wonderful. But it's not as important as what happened on September 14th, 1944. I did go and look up. <laughs> my mother, my mother, God bless her, uh, kept a very detailed uh, baby book. And not only do I have the date in there, but I also have a list of all the gifts and who gave them. <laughs> this is a kind of Italian thing, too. You always keep a record of who came and what they gave. But apart from that, so why is he insistent? And it's because of our fundamental identity. Now, let me, let me, let me go through this because often enough, uh, what people will, will, I think there's embedded in Catholic consciousness you know, let's, let's get that baby baptized because if the baby's not baptized, the baby's not going to go to heaven. God forbid something should happen. Uh, and, or a more modern take, so it's that whole thing of let's get rid of the original sin. And there's a truth in that, which I'll explain in a bit, but that's not the primary uh, concern. And then there's a, another more contemporary approach to the sacraments of initiation, particularly baptism, and they speak of baptism as a sacrament of welcome. You know, it's, it's kind of like um, if somebody's at the church door with, a, you know, part of the welcome wagon. And they're, they're saying, oh, well, welcome to the church, you know, be baptized. There's a truth in that. But that, too, is not really at the heart of it all. Not, not, not at the beginning, not at the essence, not at the foundation of baptism. It's, it's a little bit different. Here's where it starts, baptism. Starts with uh, chapter 6 of St. Paul's letter to the Romans. And go there and you will hear Paul saying to the Romans, Are you not aware that when you were baptized, you went down into the water with him and died with him so that then you could rise with him? And what Paul is, is doing there is he's evoking the, the ritual of baptism of people going into the water, symbolically dying with Christ, and then rising out of the water and rising with him, joined to him in his death and in his resurrection. So um, that, is, that is the foundation. And... Um, in that moment of, uh, by the way, uh, I, I think we're at least we're beginning to talk about this. We, we may actually even 
have a similar thing here at the cathedral. I don't know how it's all going to work, but you'll notice in some parishes that's they have a, a baptismal font, and, and that's it just, it's just magnificent and beautiful. I remember at um, St. Edward's Parish, I had the um, Easter Vigil, and uh, one, one year they had a pool, and I, I went into the pool with the person to be baptized, a man about 35 years old, 30, somewhere in there, got into the pool, knelt down, I get into the pool, the water, it was very, very touching. But then they handed him his infant son. So he's in his arms, uh, baptized the father, and then the son. And well, there was more to the story because then the 10-year-old son came running into the pool and he was baptized too. So there's this uh, wonderful experience and symbolized, and I think we're gonna try to do something like that here at the cathedral, it should be, be very nice. So in any case, St. Paul, are you not aware that when you were baptized, you went down into the waters with him so that you died with him and you might rise with him. Now, because we are joined to Christ in baptism, that means we're also joined to his body, the church. So it is entrance into the church. It's new life in Christ, union with him, and therefore union with his body, the church. And um, one way in which we can understand that is St. Paul writing to the Ephesians. He says, he speaks about one faith, one baptism, one Lord. One God who is Father of us all. And we are joined in that great communion. Because we're joined to Christ, because we're a part of his body, we're also regenerated, born again, um, a wonderful thing to do if you want a deeper understanding of baptism is go to chapter 3 of John's Gospel. And chapter 3 is the dialogue that Jesus has with Nicodemus. Nicodemus is not exactly a quick learner. Uh, and his dialogue with Jesus goes something like this. You know, Jesus says you have to be reborn to enter the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus says, well, what am I going to do? Go back into my mother's womb and be born? <laughs> Jesus insists, unless you are born of water and the Holy Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the necessity of baptism, the necessity of being reborn, and that regeneration. So remember, joined to Christ, joined to his body, and in that process, regenerated, reborn, as God's beloved sons and daughters in the Son. So, so much so that St. Paul says, both in Galatians 4 and Romans 8, that the Spirit of God has been poured into our hearts at baptism so that we can call God Abba, Father. And uh, so we really are God's adopted sons and daughters that happens in through the sacrament of, of baptism. Now, you see how this keeps getting linked, joined to Christ, therefore his body, the church, therefore regenerated and reborn as God's beloved sons and daughters. And now, in light of that, realize that through baptism, sins are forgiven. Not only personal sins, but what we call, what has theologically been called, original sin. Now people say, well, what, what is original sin? It's not personal sin, but it is that brokenness into which we are born and which afflicts all of humanity. So in chapter 7 of his letter to the Romans, Paul says, the good I want to do, I don't do. The bad I would rather avoid, I end up doing. Who's going to save me? You know, what Paul is expressing is something that all of us have felt. That inside of ourselves, there's a kind of inner split or division. We're born into that, it seems. And uh, Second Vatican Council, in the Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, uh, describes the human condition. It says, homo in se ipso divisus est. Human beings are divided within themselves. That's really the condition of original sin. 
There's a kind of brokenness. And what happens through the sacrament of baptism is that not only personal sins, if they have been committed, obviously not by an infant, but we're talking about adults being baptized, they are forgiven, but also there is the forgiveness and the healing of this original sin. Uh, and it keeps going because through this baptism, uh, joined to Christ, his body, the church, regenerated as God's beloved sons and daughters, forgiven of sin, it also calls us, this sacrament, to be his faithful disciples, to walk in his footsteps. And finally, this baptism is a pledge of our future glory. It's a pledge of our future glory. Uh, what, happens, what happens in the actual ritual is a, a, a symbolic and sacramental dying to sin and rising to new life. And at the end of our lives, at the end of our lives, we live that out as a personal liturgy. At the end of our lives, we hand ourselves over to God in order then to fully be realized in that new life in Jesus to rise with him. So there's this whole stretch that begins early and, and works its way through our lives, this identity as uh, disciples and followers of Jesus, God's beloved sons and daughters, that then comes and is consummated in our own physical death where we let go and let ourselves into God's hands and into eternal life. So, uh, go back to Pope Francis. Do you know the day you were baptized? Do you know the day? And embedded in that question is, do you realize, do you realize how important that was? How that has made all the difference? It has given you a new identity. It has given you the possibility of healing. It has made you a son or a daughter of God. It has given you the pledge of eternal life. It has given you hope. Do you know the day you were baptized? Are you going to do it? Are you going to go home and look it up? I hope. Okay, good. So there we are with baptism. Now, uh, I'd like to speak about confirmation. Confirmation, the confirmation uh, takes place when the, the, uh, the ordinarily the bishop, it could be a priest, but ordinarily it's a bishop, anoints uh, 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 people who are baptized with chrism, this especially blessed oil, and, and says, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, frequently, uh, I'd say in the last um, decades, uh, confirmation is spoken of as a sacrament of of, of Christian maturity. And that's, a, I think, especially because it's been um, reserved for adolescents, either eighth grade or high school or what have you, and, and it's seen as a uh, stepping stone. Sometimes people, uh, catechists, will uh, almost cynically say that confirmation is a sacrament of farewell because you never see them again. <laughs> they don't come back for religious education. In a certain sense, I think confirmation is really a very much a misunderstood sacrament. It is intimately linked with, with baptism, intimately linked with baptism. And um, it, it, it seals, it completes, and it intensifies that grace of baptism. But theologically, it's not always been clear what is distinctive about confirmation. So I said earlier that through baptism, we, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so, well, what else do you need then? Why do you need confirmation more? Well, here is, I think, the best way of, of understanding it. We receive the spirit of adoption as God's sons and daughters in the sacrament of baptism. And we have a share in the dying and rising of Jesus. And that mystery that we celebrate on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And the sacrament of confirmation is really the spirit, 
not just simply of adoption as God's sons and daughters, and joining the Paschal mystery of Jesus in his death and resurrection, but it is the Holy Spirit that was given on Pentecost, that mystery of Pentecost. Pentecost that enables those who are baptized to carry on the mission in the world. The people are empowered to carry on the mission of Jesus Christ in the world. And the sacrament of confirmation confers that ability through the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I, it really is a, a, a rather remarkable uh, sacrament in its own right as a sacrament of mission. Think about this. Uh, in the night, Easter Sunday night, Jesus, and this is in chapter 20 of John's Gospel, appears to the disciples in the upper room. And uh, St. John says he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Or think about Ma Matthew 28, the very end of the gospel. It's called the Great Commission. Jesus says, go, go and teach all the nations. Make them my disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That mission is not entrusted simply to priests and religious professionals, but that's the mission entrusted to the whole church and to all the baptized. I mean, that's, that's, that's what we're supposed to be about. It's very interesting. I can keep going back to Pope Francis. In his uh, apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, which is uh, in English the, the joy of the gospel, it's about evangelization. And he says the church needs to be in a permanent stance of mission, always going out, always ready to bring Jesus to this world. And he's not just talking about the religious professionals. He's talking about the whole church. And this is a, a responsibility that is entrusted to, uh, to all of us. And this is in contrast to, a, he says, as he describes it, to a church that is mainly concerned about maintaining itself or a church that is pretty much inward looking, a church that is absorbed with its own concerns. And that, he says, is not where we need to be. That's not where God wants us to be. We have to be, again, as he says, in a permanent state of mission, ready to go and share Jesus with the world. So this sacrament, the sacrament of confirmation, the seal of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment that we receive through this sacrament is really an essential part of our life so that we can carry on the mission of Jesus in the world. The third sacrament of initiation is uh, the Eucharist. Now, baptism and confirmation are only conferred once. You're only baptized once. You're only confirmed once. But the, in the ongoing Christian life, what sustains the new life that we are brought into through baptism and then sealed in confirmation, the ongoing sacrament is that of the Eucharist. We continue to celebrate the Eucharist. That sustains and renews that relationship. And uh, it continues uh, day by day to, uh, to, to, to carry us forward. And let me explain, because I think, again, the Eucharist needs to be, uh, let's start right at the heart of it all. And uh, it starts at the, the Last Supper with the bread and wine that Jesus takes. And, um, and that continues today through the celebration of the Eucharist that we all participate in and know that the priest takes bread and wine now and says in the name of Jesus, not in his own name, but in the name of Jesus, this is my body given up for you. This is my blood poured out for you. And by saying those words in his name and in the power of the Holy Spirit, what was the substance of bread and the substance of wine becomes really and truly his body and blood. But what also happens in that moment is his self-sacrifice on the cross is made present. Not repeated 
it's only once, but made present. That one unique sacrifice is made present. And what happens is that we, we over and over share in that moment. And the poet W.H. Auden uh, put it very beautifully. He said, we go and over and over again, those words are prayed, this Eucharist happens, so that the thousandth time we may finally understand. And what happens is over the course of a lifetime, as we are immersed in that self-sacrificing love of Jesus made present and real in the Eucharist, we are transformed and we begin to live like him in self-sacrificing love that gives life to this world and to other people. Um, in chapter 12 of St. Paul's letter to the Romans, he says, uh, you are a living sacrifice. That's a transformed, a Christian transformed by participation in the sacrifice of Jesus. But it doesn't stop there because we are not only sharing in his sacrifice, but we are in communion with him. In chapter 6 of John's Gospel in the Bread of Life Discourse, he says, just as I live in the Father, and have life because of the Father. Whoever shares in me, in the Eucharist, in the bread of life, has life because of me. So there is that kind of intimate communion that happens uh, through this, uh, this sacrament. And it doesn't stop there either, because it's not only sharing in his sacrifice, not only being in communion with him, but also being in communion with each other in him. St. Paul says again in his letter to the Corinthians, because the bread is one and the cup is one, we though many are one in him. And that's a, a kind of an extraordinary way in which we're bonded, not necessarily because we have common interests or common backgrounds, but at, 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 at the deepest level possible, we are one in him. And that coalesces in the, uh, in the Eucharist. Um, uh, and it doesn't stop there either, too, because this sacrament, this sacrament, uh, just as baptism leads us into eternal life, this sacrament does, too. It renews that. Again, in chapter 6 of John's Gospel, Jesus says, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will never die, will have eternal life. I will raise him up on the last day. So it really is a, a, a pledge of glory and it's also an anticipation of the end of time when all things come together. Um, St. Paul says, when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Every time we celebrate the Eucharist, we're leaning into that future, that glorious future that is ahead of us. We can never forget it as long as we share in this sacrament. And uh, also, this sacrament is, um, it's a beautiful Latin phrase. Uh, the sacrament is called the esca viatorum, which means the food of travelers. It's what sustains us on the journey. You know the story of the Israelites who were in Exodus. They were marching through the desert. They had no food. They complained to Moses, and God sent manna from the sky, bread from heaven that he gave them so that they could continue the journey. And that prefigures the Eucharist, this food from heaven that enables us to keep traveling, to keep moving, to be the pilgrim people of God on our way back home. And um, f finally, this Eucharist as, as reserved in our churches for the sick and for prayer becomes a sacrament of the continuous presence of the Lord among us. Again, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, Behold, I am with you until the end of the age. So when you keep looking, the richness of this, you have baptism that brings us into new life in Christ, confirmation that seals that, and then the Eucharist that continuously renews us in the self-sacrificing love of Jesus, 
our communion with him, our communion with one another, our life of discipleship as we travel forward, the promise of eternal life. It's extraordinary. So um, these sacraments of initiation in, in a general way bring us into union with Jesus and particularly in union with his death and resurrection so that we share his life and we find ourselves freed from sin and death to live the fullness of life, eternal life. Now, these, I want to finish with this. I think I've gone on too long already, but uh, these sacraments are not simply something that happened to us. In other words, we're not just passive recipients. Uh, every sacrament is not only a celebration in an event, but it's also meant to usher us into a whole new way of living. I'm always uh, interested in listening to people talk about the sacraments because I, I talk this way myself, probably you do too. You talk about getting the baby baptized, getting married, and even getting ordained. Now, what that says is that many of us focus on that moment, that ritual moment, which is priceless and precious and, and really important. But it's not just that. It's not just the ritual sacramental moment. It's the life that it ushers us into. Baptism as disciples of Jesus. And, and in getting married, as many of you know, brings you into a whole new range of life. Getting ordained, same thing. It's not just the moment, it's the life that follows. So uh, the sacraments are not just things that happen to us, but we need to embrace the life that follows. And they are tied to faith and commitment and promises that we make. Um, they're not just um, magical moments. And we are also called to what I, 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 I would term sacramental accountability. If this is a sacrament we celebrate, then we have to take a look. Are we being faithful to living that sacrament out? You remember St. Paul. St. Paul loved the Corinthian community, but they were also a pretty, um, I would not necessarily wild crowd, but uh, unruly at times. And he said to them in, in his first letter, he said, you know, when you come together to celebrate the Eucharist, uh, one person eats, another person gets drunk. The poor people are ignored. You're not, really, you're not really living out what you're celebrating. He was calling them to Eucharistic accountability, sacramental accountability. And that is something that needs to touch us as well. So um, that's it, the sacraments of initiation. Uh, they have made all the difference for you and me. They brought us into new life. They will bring us into eternal life. And now I think we're going to have a bit of a break. Let's go. Good.